we're trying to do is find the uh, weed line and the fish are gonna be around the weed line. This one is a little more barren over here. We're really looking for fish right now. Fish, that is a fish right there, boom. Oh yeah, here we go, Jer. That's a real jumble, wow. Crappies, crappies. A little of both. First ice to last ice, panfish are the most popular species to target during the winter months. And in fact, panfish are going to be the topic of this week's show. We're going to be breaking down location. And they're going to be in these back bays, channels, usually. Gear. If they're there, you see them. Tactics that you're going to want to use to chase panfish. <laughs> That's dead sticking in a nutshell. We're going to talk to guys like Dave Gens. You know, my go-to is the Jamie. Brian Brosdahl. Sometimes switching to another spot on a lake, you could find active fish. Jason Mitchell. Kind of like a, a power fishing strategy for panfish. Hitting on everything you need to know to put more panfish on the ice this winter. Stay tuned. First things first, you can't catch them if you can't find them. So we're gonna start off by talking to Tony Mariotti on how to find good panfish lakes. You know, I get, I get asked an awful lot about how do we find these areas that hold such big panfish. You know, we say location, location, location. Well, Everybody knows of the big lakes. You got your leech lake, and but the thing that I like to do to find the less common fish is to get out and fish bodies of water that maybe there aren't a lot of people on, or maybe they're overlooked by a lot of people. I spend a lot of time looking at maps. I spend a lot of time looking at DNR Lake Finder. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful tool that'll help you by going to the Lake Finder app or on the website. You can type in a name of a lake, and it'll give you any information that the DNR has gathered on it as far as fish. So the key is to find a lake that you're familiar with. Um, grab your lake, take a look at it on Google Earth. Look at that color, you know, or look at 10, 12 lakes that you know hold fish. Look at that color, look at the depth. You're gonna be able to kind of see that on other lakes. If you're looking for those, maybe those special fish, those 14 inch crappies or those 10 and plus inch bluegills, you have to fish in a body of water that has them. Then you can look a lot of times at, maybe there's a public right of way, maybe there is some state land or tax forfeiture land that allows you to access that body of water. Or even easier, maybe that body of water is accessible to anybody. Maybe there's a public access on it, but very few people fish it. But by getting out there, doing a little bit of research, getting access to that lake, and then getting out there and making it happen is definitely kind of my secret for finding my big bluegills, my big crappies, and if you're willing to put in a little bit of work, those are the keys to do it. Now that you do have a good lake, you gotta know that the panfish are moving around all season long from early season to ice out, and to stay on top of the fish, you gotta know where they live. So we're gonna pass it off to my buddy, Tony Boschold. He's gonna break it all down. When it comes to the fish movements, they're essentially making duplicate movements in the summer as they are in the winter. You get turnover, things get churned up, and they can get themselves up shallow, and they start staging for basically first ice where they're gonna be right when uh, the ice comes on. They're gonna be in these back bays, channels, usually are typical for the panfish that we're fishing. And then the snow cover comes in, you have a lot of weeds lose oxygen, they need the sunlight, so with the, without that penetration, the weeds start to die, and when they die, they off-gas. And when they're off-gassing, the fish get pushed out to those deeper, flats that they want to work they'll you know crappies will hit points hard bottom points the bluegills are generally in some you know soft bottom areas that's your more midwinter action and then again as uh, you start to get the 
the late ice, you get the water flowing down the holes, all the snow is melting, and that oxygenates those shallows, it pushes those fish back into those channels and bays where they want to spawn. So if you know where those spawning areas are, you want to kind of draw your lines from the deeper water right into those spawning grounds and just start drilling that way and, and that's generally where you're going to contact these fish. So, you know, that's about it. <laughs> When it comes to ice fishing, two things separate the men from the boys. Number one is mobility, and number two is efficiency. Now Dave Gens pioneered both of those things, and he is the godfather of ice fishing. He invented mobility and warmth out on the ice with his original fish traps. He was one of the first guys to be using sonar out on the ice, and now he's going to talk about another efficiency, and that's using plastics for panfish. Definitely times when I like using plastic. Uh, it's, it's more so when the fish are shallower and they're, they're, in, they're in amongst the weeds. There gets to be a lot more bugs that are swimming around, things that are swimming around in the water. Oh, the Jamie is probably one of my favorite ones from uh, Mackie Plastics. Uh, another one I like uh, is the Polly. The Polly fishes horizontal on a vertical bait and it works great for fishing uh, close to the bottom when fish are feeding on bloodworms and things. The Jamie is a uh, more of a bug looking creature. Uh, a trick that I do on sometimes is I'll take one of them Jamie XLs and put it sideways on the jig instead of flat so it gives more profile and sometimes that can trigger fish especially if the, if the fish are feeding on, on small bluegills which is prime food for a lot of fish in the winter time. Now the popularity of plastics for panfish has blown up in recent years and another thing that's blown up is the use of tungsten jigs. I'm gonna pass it off to my buddy Jeremy and he's gonna talk about some of the characteristics that make them different than lead. One of my go-to's that I've just been having so much luck with since it's come out is this little tungsten jig. It's called a probe. It's like a perfect bloodworm imitator. Crappies, perch, and sunnies just love this little, little beauty right here. But one of the big things with tungsten, if you haven't fished with it yet, even for the shallow water, because of course tungsten is much more dense than lead and it's very valuable of course if you're fishing in deep water but also the shallow water if you're hole hopping there's slush it punches right through the slush and also it gives you really good feel it also shows up great on your depth finder so tungsten has many advantages and these days it's essentially all that i ever fish with so there are two main styles of panfish jigs vertical and Horizontal. A horizontal jig, you can imagine you've got the jig head and you've got the hook coming off it with your bait or soft plastic and so that jig head might take up a big part of that profile. Okay, and so when fish are looking up at it, they see the bait or they see the tail, then they see that, that lead or tungsten head. Whereas a vertical jig, that's hidden. And so when you hook a soft plastic or your bait on horizontally on a vertical jig, and the fish are looking up at it, that vertical jig disappears, and so it moves less water, it's a lot more subtle. So that being said, when you're trying to find fish and trying to catch aggressive fish, that horizontal jig really shines. When you're really dealing with some of those tougher fish that uh, just take a lot more finesse and, and you gotta pull your hair out to catch them, especially come midwinter when we get a lot of snow, definitely try that vertical jig and uh, you know, lose less water, much smaller profile, when those fish get tough, it's amazing how well that vertical jig will work. Now there's more to pan fishing than using small, tiny, micro finesse baits. Sometimes you want to go loud and proud and call fish in from a distance, and that's one of Tony Roach's favorite ways to catch pan fish. What's cool about ice fishing today is we've got a lot of options when it comes to tackle to use in our arsenal. You know, great rattling horizontal baits to awesome spoons with all sorts of different designs all the way down to small, really light tungsten jigs, fly style jigs. I like to utilize all of them. You know, I, I tend to fish kind of loud and proud when I'm searching for fish. So when I'm on a panfish mission, doesn't matter if it's bluegills or crappies or perch, I like to use, you know, really loud profile baits, whether it's a larger spoon to a rip and wrap or a jigging wrap, kind of those call baits to see if I can get fish to come to your location. You know, what's great about panfish in particular, like perch and bluegills, uh, they love to come into a camera or they love to come into a bait. So anything you drop down in the water column, they're really curious creatures. So they like to come in and investigate. 
that's why I typically, when I'm in search of fish, will use that really loud and proud bay just to kind of locate those fish. And then you can really determine the, the, the mood of the fish pretty quickly. I mean, if those fish are marching up, but putting on the brakes and they just don't quite like what presentation you have, you can downsize a little bit. If they come in, but they're really just not moving at all in the water column, that's when I'll downsize to some of those really light tungstens. There's some really good bead baits out there that you can have total control over your bait. Cause that's one thing when you're fishing panfish, especially in a finesse situation, you want to have total control over that bait. You know, I, I, I tend to fish like an advanced mono or a fluorocarbon or a braid. And I tend to use lighter lines, like two, three pound test at the most. That way I have absolute control over the bait. Whatever I'm doing with my rod, it, it's mirroring that or puppeting that bait exactly. Cause panfish, as you know, can be some of the most finicky fish, but they can be some of the most aggressive fish. So if you start with that search tool in the beginning to find the fish and you land on them, you can always downsize from there to having a successful day on the ice. Now, in my personal opinion, line choice is one of the most underrated aspects of presentation. And one thing that you'll notice is that all of the top ice fishermen are using the same kind of line. I've been using suffix for years. Probably one of my go-tos is a frost line. I love fishing Nanofil for ice fishing. I use like a two pound suffix. Sunline just kicks butt. I like thin fire line. Frost ice. Uh, my go-to is suffix fluorocarbon. It's also called Invisalign. I use a lot of the suffix ice magic. That's an easy one. It's Berkeley Trilene 100% fluorocarbon. Okay, so maybe they don't agree on brand, but they're all using the same pound test, right? Two pound is always my go-to. I'm fishing more three pound test line now. Most of the time I'm fishing two pound. It's the two pound fluorocarbon clear. I like the three pound a lot because you get the strength of four pound, but it feels like two pound. If I'm going to a lake with maybe a shot at a real toad. I'll bump it up to three. I think we've all been there. We've grabbed all this some line and go, this is really strong four pound. Well, obviously it ain't four pound, but it's really strong. Line diameter is, is my biggest factor, I think, in line choice, is trying to find the thinnest, strongest line I can get. <laughs> so can we at least agree that it's either mono, floral, or braid? There's a lot of good lines, but I like a soft, Mono. I tend to use more monofilament just because I'm outside drilling holes, moving around. I like fluorocarbon. I'm a big believer in the Japanese fluorocarbons. Um, I think they're some of the strongest in the world. Fluorocarbon's been a real a big deal. Um, I don't like to use straight up fluorocarbon. I, I use a lot of bionic. It's floral carbon um, coated monofilament line. I like fluorocarbon because it actually sinks. I like the monofilament because it's got a little bit of stretch to it. Whenever applicable, whether I'm in a hard house or inside a shelter, I tend to use like a one to two pound braid with fluorocarbon leader. We're going to see more panfish finesse people using braided line in certain situations. And one of the best situations is when it's 20 below. When it's 20 below, everything sucks. Well, I guess you could say that it comes down to personal preference. Well, now we're gonna change gears and we're gonna talk about my favorite ways to find panfish, especially in the weeds. So what we like to do is we'll, we'll drill a number of holes on this flat. So I'm gonna be the guy cutting and then Mike is gonna follow behind me with the camera and we're not even gonna let wet a line until we see a fish. Yeah, so typically it's been our experience that when these fish are up shallow and they're in the weeds, bluegills, and crappies are very curious fish along with bass, but if they're there, you see them. So I've been a huge fan of just using this little underwater AquaView micro camera and just going around and following behind Jeremy and looking for the fish. And we won't even like drop a line like he said until we see the fish, but if they're not there, we're not gonna fish. Oh yeah, here we go, Jer. There's fish. We got them. They're up, they're out. There we go, yep, I see them off in the distance. They're Sunnies, crappies. A little of both. Ooh. There's, there's shadows in the background, but they are here. Sweet. So I am, oh, there's one looking right at me right there. Hi. Little sunfish. One in the background. Oh, there's another one. Yeah, they just, like they just appear. That's they just cool. show up. So I'm gonna go poke a, 
a look at a couple more and see if you can catch a couple of these. I'll try these. Devils. And the other nice thing too is when we're in the weeds like this, a lot of times with your depth finder, you drop it down and it might look like it's weeds when in fact it's uh, fish. So it's pretty cool for Mike to truth that and know what's, what's behind. So I'm going to check out the size of the fish in this hole and see if indeed there are some nice panfish here. Usually when one shows up, more, more over follow. here, Jeremy. Way more over there? Yep. Wow. What do you got over there? I think I got a nice sunny if I were oh nice crappie. Really? Perfect. Yeah, look at that. All right. Pan so up, about. Mike. Was he up high? It was, yeah. I'm in eight feet here and that one was probably four feet down. So it may look like Jeremy's having all the fun here catching the fish and I'm just walking around like a like a moron with the camera, but I enjoy this as much as I do the fishing because it's showing you where the fish are for one. And two, you get to see what they're doing, you know? So it's like, you know that, that they're running high over the weeds. You don't have to go down as far. And if I put the camera down here next to his jig, I could see how they were reacting to it too. So right. despite not fishing, I'm still kind of fishing. <laughs> now we all love chasing crappies and bluegills, but you can't forget about one of the tastiest fish out there, and that is the perch. So now we're gonna check in with Broski up in Bro Country, chasing perch. We're gonna go hunting perch. Nothing's better than big jumbo perch. Gotta have spoons, gotta have jigs. Skeleton minnows, the best plastic known to mankind. And then you can never have enough rods. A gill getter with a, a partial skeleton minnow, impulse crayfish. That was an awesome one the other day. We're ready, let's do it. It's all about clearance and flotation. We're in bro country. There's gonna be fish in bro country. Oh, there we go. There's a nice perch. I know there's gonna be some fish here because I see a lot of them on the screen. So I'll probably set up a house right here. Now I've got the camera here and the neat thing about these snake arms is I have to just move it slightly over this way so I can keep my jig in the center. Oh, there's perch. Wow, that was a fast hit. That perch just came flying in from the side. There you come this, oh there, <laughs> wow. There's a real jumbo perch right there. Midwinter, basin, foraging for insect life, that's a real jumbo. The perch will follow their food, and if there's insects, minnows, and crayfish, or freshwater shrimp, all in a combination, you're gonna have jumbo perch, and I'm gonna have some chowder. Perch chowder! Now we're ready to build some chowder. Believe me, this is the best portable fish house food you'll ever eat. On high heat in an eight quart stock pan, add oil and sweet onions. Dice carrots and celery until onions become translucent. Add in garlic and saute for another two minutes to release the aroma. Add in sweet potatoes, red bliss potatoes, and then saute for another minute. Now add some tomato soup and spaghetti sauce. Shredded carrots, green beans, black beans, and kidney beans. Diced tomatoes and water. Now add some Frank's Red Hot Sauce, celery salt, paprika, cayenne pepper. Bring to a boil and reduce to simmer. About an hour and a half, stirring occasionally. Add perch and cook another 20 minutes. Add in almond milk at the end, cooked wild rice, and Parmesan cheese. Add salt and pepper to your taste. Stir until it incorporates and cooks into a nice mix. Another five minutes. Now you can see why bro never gets cold on the ice. It's Heather's chowder. Got a little bit of everything oh, yeah. in there. Look at yeah. that bowl. That is piping hot. Can't burn my new fish. You want a bite? <laughs> if you dropped it, it would melt through the ice. <laughs> Now let's head over to one of Minnesota's best fish factories, Leech Lake, to talk with Jeremy Smith and Area Fisheries Supervisor, Doug Schultz. 
When a lot of people think of Leech Lake, they think of the great walleye fishery that it is. They think of, you know, muskies because it is world class in both those regards. But the perch right now have been getting a lot of attention, I would say. I mean, they, perch are always popular when they're around, but wintertime perch fishing on Leech Lake seems to be becoming more and more popular, especially the years you can get around. And what are you seeing with, with perch populations on the lake right now? Well, you're, you're right, pressure has really increased in the last 10 years or so with, with the advent of uh, a lot of the new ice gear that's out there. Yep. And uh, that coupled with, uh, you know, some resorts got a little more uh, uh, active with plowing roads, bigger road systems, and uh, increased a lot more uh, water available to folks and they've really been taking advantage of it. Um, perch harvest has been pretty high some years. Uh, usually it's the years where we have a late spring. Uh, the ice is late going off, we have a lot of ice, so you, they got a solid month to, to go out and actually chase perch, find them, and, and really take advantage of them. Of them. Like you said, the ice, or the, most, oh. Of the, oh, yes, most of the oh, snow good. is off the lake, and the fish start, you know, start biting, and there's places all over the lake, whether you're fishing, you know, out of the city of Walker, you can come out to the north end of Walker Bay, there's great opportunities there up through Steamboat, of course, Sucker Bay, Portage Bay, there's opportunities on the east side over in headquarters and Boy Bay, so the, the perch are you know really found throughout the lake, and it's a, there are great opportunities. And then you know some of the panfish we filmed up here a number of times in the spring, and leech I would say has on average like the biggest crappies we've filmed anywhere. It's got some of the biggest bluegills and big lakes like leech. You know those those always seem to be home to really 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 big fish. You know part of that equation is the densities are moderate to low. Um, yep. Generally, when you have high density fish populations, growth rate suffers. Um, they tend to get bottled up at smaller sizes. There's just not enough food to really go around. That's one reason uh, these big systems tend to, tend to crank out the, the quality sizes that, that sure. they do for a lot of species is just the, the densities tend to be in the moderate or, or lower range. The other thing that happened on Leech when I lived up here, it was the, the days when, oh, the walleyes are gone, you know, there's no walleyes left in the lake. and, and uh, but. Since that time, it has become just an incredible walleye fish. I mean, leech has always been, been good, but um, there was some stocking that was done. Uh, there's been a slot limit in place for a number of years. That regulation worked very well for us and, and, and was a big part of uh, improving that, that fishery in a very short amount of time. That and a couple of big year classes in a row really helped out too once we started controlling cormorants. And then uh, we've continued to exceed our, our management objectives with the walleye population. So. Well, that's really cool. I mean, what a what a great success story in fisheries management. I mean, this is one of Minnesota's. Ooh, that felt like a good fish. One yeah. of Minnesota's uh, best lakes, no doubt about it. I mean, it's just got so many you know wonderful fishing opportunities. Catch lots of walleyes, catch tons of perch, and if you really want to get after it, there's some world class pan fish as well. So, Absolutely. thanks for all the great work you guys are doing up here. This is awesome. Yeah, thanks a bunch. I'm gonna. I still gotta outfish you. <laughs> you will. <laughs>we are talking about panfish, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about small tungsten jigs. Now there's a time and place for lead, but tungsten is denser and you can have a smaller profile with the same amount of weight. And one of my favorite tungsten jigs, the Mighty Mouse from Northland. And what I like about this particular jig is it's got those goofy looking eyes in front. And what those do is allow the bait to have a really cool rocking motion in the water. 
and it's really great for fishing worms, whether it's larva or wax worms, etc. I'm gonna move over to another tungsten jig over here, and that is the drop kick jig from Clam. Now this right here is another tungsten lure that has a similar rocking motion. It's got a lot of really, really cool colors. That's one thing I like about this particular jig is the color selection. And of course, it's a Dave Gens favorite, so that always helps, right? Over here to the plastics, we want to talk about the Pauly from Clam. And this is a super simple bait. If you're just getting into plastics fishing, getting away from the live bait, I'd recommend something like this, where it's just a simple straight tail, these baits are super subtle and they impart a lot of action. Another good option too is a little bit of an upsizing option and that is the Mackie from Clam. Now as you can see this bait has a lot of different appendages that flap around. It's a little bit bulkier, a really good crappie bait actually, but if you're looking to upsize this is a great option as well. So a couple other plastic offerings that I like to use. First off right here. It's the Northland Impulse Bloodworm. Works great for bluegills and crappies. Another excellent option is the Northland Skeleton Minnow. Now this is actually a really, really unique bait. It's got an interesting tail, really, really cool action. And I actually have a lot of confidence in this bait. I will say this might be my favorite plastic bait for crappies in particular, because the profile is quite large. Now there's no question that small micro jigs catch a bunch of fish, especially when the bite is tough. But when the bite isn't quite as tough, it can be really fun to upsize to a larger offering, specifically a number three rip and wrap. This particular lure has rattles, it'll call fish in, and one particular situation where I like to use rip and wraps is for basin crappies. And why I like to use in that situation is because this bigger lure will select for the bigger fish in the school so you're not dealing with the smaller fish that are pecking at your bait. Now when it comes to pan fishing rods, there's two major fields of thought when it comes to bite detection. Number one, the most popular, is the soft noodly tips. And number two is spring bobbers. Now I personally like to use spring bobbers and this one right here is the St. Croix Legend Black Spring Bobber Rod. And this one is my absolute favorite because the spring is extremely sensitive, adjustable, and in my opinion, you just can't beat the bite detection of a spring, especially when you're chasing super finicky bluegills that are just breathing on the bait. Super soft bites, I go with the spring. Now, when you're out hunting panfish, whether you're in a basin or a giant weed bed, sometimes you need to drill a bunch of holes. And in those situations, it pays to have an auger that's both light and fast. Now this Strike Master Light Flight is extremely light, extremely fast, and you can mount it on a 40 volt head or a cordless drill. So speaking of cordless drills, if you hook one up to your auger, sometimes it can be a little bit awkward and actually sometimes dangerous. You can tweak your wrist and that's why it pays to have some sort of drill plate like this one from Clam. It's just a great option to keep your thumb safe, your wrist safe, and it's also a lot more ergonomical than, than a single drill. You just mount it up on your drill and you're ready to go. Now, if you're in the market for some new ice electronics, there's a wide variety of options today. And if you're one of those flasher guys, this one here is actually the granddaddy of them all, the FLX28 from Vexlar, the 60th anniversary edition. Now, this one really has a lot of bells and whistles. It's got the glow ring, it's got a little adjustable light right there, and kind of the patented toughness of the Vexlar units. Now, on the other hand, over here, is kind of one of like the newer generation of ICE electronics. With LCD screens, recorded history, right here is the Hummingbird ICE Helix 7 G3 Chirp. GPS. Now that's a mouthful. What that basically means is that as far as the Humminbird units goes, this has all the bells and whistles. You can put Lake Master maps in them. You have the recorded history. You can do split screen. And the sonar itself is extremely responsive. One of the knocks on some of the older units like this was that there was a little bit of delay. There's no delay anymore. These things are absolutely killer. And it's my go-to unit. Now today's sonar technology is pretty ridiculous, but sometimes you just can't beat dropping a camera down the hole and seeing them for yourself. 
This one right here is the Aquaview Micro Revolution 5.0 Pro. And as far as hole hopping goes, this is the camera that you want. It's got the spool on the back for picking up the cord. And not only that, but this particular unit also gives you the ability to record what you see. So you can post it up on Facebook, or maybe not. Maybe you just want to share it with a few select buddies. But anyway, that's the Aquaview Micro Revolution 5.0, a great camera. Now, if we're being honest, for a lot of people, ice fishing is synonymous with harvesting. And that's totally fine. We like to preach selective harvest and letting a lot of the bigger fish go. But sometimes when you're out fishing with your buddies, you might have a big fish fry at home. You might have a big mess of fish that you have to clean. And in those cases, it pays to have an electric knife like this one from Bubba. This particular unit has four different blades. It has a powerful motor, comfortable handle, slick little carrying case too. And when you're processing a lot of fish or even bigger fish, it pays to have an electric knife. Now last up for all you hard house guys getting ready for the season, chances are you've probably got a good mess of these in your house. The classic catch cover hole covers, they work great, bulletproof covers. But what you might not have is the catch cover safety cover. Now what's great about this particular unit is it's got this hole right here where you put your line and a path to slide the line in. Great for dead sticks, great for rattle reels. And everybody's always messing around on their phone or jiggling their keys around and oftentimes those two items end up in the hole. Not with this thing, super slick system. Now, as you can see, you can find all of these products in your local Fleet Farm store. So make sure to head in and grab a few. Now, a couple items that I forgot to pick up at the store was number one, a reel. Now we talked a little bit about using spring bobbers and I like to pair my spring bobber rods with an inline reel. To me, it's just a lot better for line management when you're using small tungsten jigs. This particular reel is a new one that recently came on the market from Clam. It's called the Gravity Elite Inline Reel. And one thing you'll notice about this reel is that it has a little trigger system right there, which will slowly deploy your jig down into the water column as opposed to pulling it out like you normally have to with uh, inline reels. Now what I've got on the end of the line here is a new bait from VMC and that is the tungsten bullfly. Now this thing, as you'll see, is very similar to the tungsten fly jig that came out a few years ago with one little modification and that's this little spiky deal right here. You know, in a lot of cases when I was using the fly jig in the past, I would tip it with a little spike plastic. This kind of removes the need to put anything on it at all. It's a great little jig that you're gonna wanna check out. This is one of my absolute favorite jigging setups right here. But another great way to catch panfish through the ice is dead sticks. You know, in addition to being really fun to fish with a dead stick, you know, there's a lot of added benefits. I like fishing dead sticks over a lot of other means like bobbers or even tip-ups because it's fun. You set it up on a, on a stand like I have here and you watch that rod tip fold over. It's got plenty of backbone for hook setting power. <laughs> That's dead sticking in a nutshell. I didn't even have my line set up yet. Mine's a pretty simple setup. I like to use plain hooks tipped with a minnow and then just a sinker setup like this with either a swivel or a split shot. And then I like to set my drag really, really loose, you know, so when I'm actually setting this line, once I get the minnow on there and dropping it down, when a fish hits it, it can take it and kind of free spool with it before I get to my rod. You know, the other added benefit about having the dead stick down there, when you have a live minnow down there, it keeps the fish in the area for a longer period of time. So whether it's panfish, you're after walleyes, doesn't matter. So even if you're jigging on one rod and setting up a dead stick here, it kind of keeps those fish in the area. I like to use my depth finder to set my dead sticks. That way I can set it at or just above the fish. Like right now we're marking some crappies and bluegills are suspended a little bit. So I'm just gonna set it here and then set it in the rod holder like so. I like it where the tip sits up a little bit. The other thing is the drag is really loose. So when a fish actually strikes this, I can watch it. And you can do it outside like I'm doing right now. What's cool about this St. Croix is it's got a, a real bright tip so you can see it from afar. When I set it out here, the contrast against the snow and ice, you can really see that thing move just like now. We've got a fish going. 
I'm just gonna give them a little line, pull it out of here, just like that. That's how a dead stick works, that nice soft tip, but see how it loads up, there's plenty of backbone in this rod. That's exactly how a dead stick's supposed to work. Oh, decent crappie. Just like that. I hardly had my mark come out of the hole before this one raced up, but that's what makes dead sticks so effective is, is that live minnow, you know, crappies in particular can't resist it. But once again, you know, especially if you're set up in a, in a shelter, it just gives you another option for another bait out there. Uh, it, like I said, it keeps the fish in the area, makes it fun, dead sticking. If you haven't tried it, you got to pick up a dead stick rod. It's going to improve your fish catch all winter long. Well, now that we've shown you how to put a million panfish on the ice, let's talk about something that all the ice pros can agree on, and that is conserving our resources. I remember the days of 100 perch. I remember the 30 sunfish and the 15 crappie. Today's world's different than it was 25 years ago. Bluegills are a fleeting resource in the North Country. Our panfish are getting smaller and smaller. I think we need to do a way better job at conserving our panfish. They're going to be gone. Unfortunately, I think every single state in the northern part of the United States has too high of, of limits on panfish. I'm all for having regulations that allow us to keep a reasonable number of fish, a meal or so of fish. When it comes to panfish regulations, it's a really hard one. You know what's tricky about all of our fisheries is that there's not a one-size-fits-all. I put it to like whitetail. Do we want numbers? Do we want size? I like these special regulations lakes and I seek out special regulation lakes to go fish. Panfish slots need to happen sooner rather than later. For bluegills, I think it's really simple. I think the challenge is getting people to measure their fish. If you take the bigger fish out of the water, bluegills, their population stunk. No win. Um, to throw back a 9, 10-inch bluegill, know how important, you know, a 12 to, you know, 16-inch crappie is to a fishery and release those fish just like you'd release a big bass or, you know, a big predator fish because uh, it takes just as long for those fish to grow. I think in general, from the DNR to the anglers to the guides, we need to do a lot better job at preserving our panfish so we have some in the future. So a lot of people think that there's a million panfish in the lake and that you can't fish it out, or if it does get fished out, that these populations can replenish. But in some cases, that's just not true. Like for instance, with bluegills, if you take the biggest bluegills out of a system, in some cases, that'll stunt the rest of the population permanently. Now, we're gonna transition to another topic that a lot of people don't quite fully understand, and that's deep water fishing and barrel trauma. Not a giant crappie, but right now, we're out in the basin looking for lunch. One of the key patterns to catch crappies in a, a lot of our moderate sized lakes is you find the deep water basins and a lot of the fish gather into these holes and it could be anywhere from like 25 to as deep as 45 foot of water. Right now we're fishing in 40. Uh, one thing that's really vitally important is angling ethics in this situation in the fact that, that this is not a catch and release situation. This is more of a straight harvest. Perfect eater. So one of the myths you might have heard, people say, uh, you know, if you get fish in deep water, you just reel them up slow and they'll release just fine. Well, it's just not true. The way that the fish process the gas expansion in their air bladder would take them basically to catch a fish like this and have it survive and reel it slow, you'd have to reel it up for about three hours. So that's not, not really in the card. So and again, above and beyond just that expansion of their air bladder from the prep pressure difference, you've got capillaries that are exploding. And you'll see, I'll lay this crappie out for just a minute here and I'll show you in probably 60 seconds or so, you'll see a bunch of redness around its mouth, around its eyes, around its gills. And those are capillaries exploding from that pressure pressure difference. So if you're going to do this, figure out how many fish you want to catch, get down there, get them up, enjoy it, and move on. All right, so that was a bit of a longer video, but I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to hit that little red button down below, the subscribe button, and also head down to the link in the description and sign up for our huge ice fishing giveaway. There's a lot of great stuff from a lot of great companies. Well, all this talking is making me hungry, so I'm gonna eat some fish, and until next time, I'll see you on the ice. 
I have this, this constant dream that I've had for most of my life where I'm fishing in these really urban type of settings. Like, uh, you know, someone's flooded basement grows these huge I've bluegills. Too. Yeah, yeah, or like this backwater little creek. Yeah. I find all these huge bluegills like in these like in willow a, swamp. In a, in yeah. a pothole in yeah. the street. Yeah, like, like a sewer drain like in a street. And I'll pull it back and it'll just be loaded with bluegills underneath there. You know, yeah, I, one no. weird dream that I've had too is where like, I dug holes in my yard and then I fished, you know? <laughs> <laughs> a lot yeah, of times like yeah. in the basement one, like it'll be like a, a, a vent for a furnace and how I can get my presentation down in between that vent to pull a bluegill out from underneath there. <laughs> and it's just bizarre. One time when my wife and I were first married and we're lay, laying in bed and all of a sudden this hand comes over. And it comes over to her face. My wife watches, and I just barely touch her nose, <laughs> and then I and I and it leaves. And my wife is like, you know, wake up! What are you doing? Oh, I just got the leech. I find myself setting the hook or oh, you yeah, know, oh, reacting yeah. to something. Oh yeah. Did, I've had, I have it that I'm walking on the bottom yeah. of the lake, and <laughs> it's and I'm I'm seeing how the structure is laid out. Oh God. Yeah, I mean, I I think about fishing a lot. <laughs>